Welcome back. Now, following the deep dive, there is an awful lot to talk about. So I found three of the very best. Oh, you're so happy. <laughs> But I think just in case people aren't super familiar with Cyberpunk 2077, why don't you introduce yourself one by one so everybody knows who they're who they're listening to? Hey, I'm Miles. I'm one of the level designers at CD Projekt Red. Hello, I'm Pavo, and I'm a lead of the Quest team. And it's a great pleasure to be talking to you. So I'm Philip, and I'm one of their Quest designers. So I work really closely with Pavel over here. Ah, oh, thank you guys for being my victim. I mean, my participants <laughs> in this uh, video. Let's get started because the last demo we saw took place in Watson. This time we're in Pacifica. They're very different, and that's super important for Night City that it feels different. So, what do you need to consider as a level designer when you're building a place like this? Right, we are diving right into it. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's go. People want to know answers. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going. I'm going. Uh, so. From a level design point of view, for us, it's really important to create these districts, the six ones that we have in Night City, to be as different as possible without making it unbelievable, right?、Um, and we sort of orient ourselves around sort of how we approached,、um, let's say, Skellige and Novigrad, Norman's Land in The Witcher Three. So we're sort of aiming for a very noticeable difference, and this has multiple purposes, right? First off.、Um, We want to enhance the variety in the game, right? It would be kind of boring just to have a lot of the same throughout the entire city.、Um, we have one cityscape, so we need to create this kind of variety, and、uh, that's actually a really fun creative process as well. And secondly, we need it as a navigational tool. That means that、um, when you, as a player, move around the city.、Um, You should know where you are simply by looking around, and thankfully, there's a lot of lore that we can sort of dissect and make our own that helps us around. But we also add our own sort of twists、uh, to the whole thing, right? So, in terms of Pacifica,、um, we know that it's pretty <laughs> place, if I can <laughs> say so. And、um, uh, in, uh, what I mean with that is that it's pretty noticeable that it's.、Uh, Almost post-apocalyptic, right?、Um, the district has a rich history that caused it to basically fall into disarray after、um, it was initially meant to become the the city's crown jewel of of tourism.、Um, but clearly, as you can see from the footage, that actually didn't quite work out that way. And、uh, now you'll actually see things like burning cars on the streets, right? And、uh, um, it's very deserted. So. Much unlike Watson that we showed last year, where the streets are bustling with people, here there's way less,、um, because it's simply a very dangerous place that you don't want to really go if you don't have to. And again, that's one of these things that once you enter the district from the rest of Night City, you'll actually notice that, right? And of course, all the destruction going on and、uh, all of the, yeah, I mean. Suffering and pain. <laughs> Our favorite things. And violence, <laughs> as it were. So, what kind of things are exclusive to Pacifica? Because you don't want people to just come for the quest and then leave, and that's it. You want people to keep coming back to this district. So, what can people find there?、Um, I mean, is, this is what I meant when I said、uh, like it's a very fun process to think of these kind of things because the sort of characteristics that we give the district directly sort of birth. The things that you can find there, right? And uh, uh, amongst the destruction, you'll still find people living there, right?、Uh, Pacifica is inhabited by a large Haitian community, and uh, uh, each district sort of has a kind of dominant gang who has taken over there. In the case of Pacifica, that would be the Voodoo Boys, and、uh, unlike the Maelstromers that we saw last year, the Voodoo Boys are actually deeply ingrained within the community that lives there, and.、Uh, They actually,、um, they're they're not your typical sort of、uh, street gang in the sense that they don't really bring a lot of gun power to fight themselves, but they actually、uh, specialize in cyberspace. They're obsessed with the mysteries of cyberspace. They've sort of almost made it their own religion, if you will, and、uh, they they have the reputation of being the best netrunners that you can find in in, in Night City, and. It's a very cool gang that V, of course, our main protagonist,、uh, will interact with in several ways. How you will have to find out.、Um, and I mean, that's just one of many, many different ways you'll really uh, experience uh, Pacifica.、Uh, as I said, all of these things together—the culture, the the visuals, the architecture, and、uh, the the history—really. 
um, will have will have or will be very distinct to the district. Um, at the same time, we're of course trying really hard to not make it feel disconnected. Right? There's always a link. It should always be believable. That's uh, one of the sort of core pillars that we build everything on. Um, but this will make it for a very unique experience when you delve an adventure in this district compared to others. And when looking at the stories that we'll be telling in this exact district, we always make sure that it always fits to the environment, to what we want to build. So, you know, the street stories that you will find, their side quests, and the main quest that is actually place there, it always tells the story of the community, of the people, of the characters that are living there. And the Haitian community, right, they they arrived actually in Night City because of the environmental changes that were happening in the world. Uh, Haiti is actually completely flooded and they have left it. They came, arrived to Night City to build uh, the district that Miles just talked about and uh, they were left out at the moment when the corporations withdrawn all the funding uh, from the Pacifica. They were left there and they built their own community there and they uh, gave the, the, the seed, they become the seed uh, for all the stories that we are telling there. So as a player, when you're like investing, meeting all those characters and talking to them, you actually find out and learn more about them, you know, through the quests. Perfect. But let's talk about the more we just saw in the deep dive video, because that's not linear. Nope. So how do you design uh, a non-linear level? You've got the building, you're thinking, right, well, the person who's playing on their game, they might have a more techie style of playthrough, but this person might want to go in all guns blazing. How do you design levels for all these different play styles? Anything's possible. Yes, uh, yeah, we do give the player a lot of different tools to use as he goes through a level, and that makes designing these things quite complex, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will say. But, you know, just to sort of understand our mentality, um, I can actually, I'll, I'll attempt, maybe you'll help me out with this one, to, to go back uh, um, uh, in our development, uh, uh, well, sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and to really sort of, we, we came up with this example to sort of uh, establish this kind of mentality that we wanted to have when we approached our level designs and the way we do our encounters, right? And the example was rather simple. The goal was um, for a player to, like, uh, to go from one room to another, but uh, the, the, the main way to go from that one room to another would be sort of like a door. Um, and be it through like a scanner or a device, it doesn't really matter for the example actually. Going through this door would ultimately result in the player losing his weapons, but the task was to actually kill a person on the other side of that door, right? Now, we use this sort of example to, to sit down and think, okay, what, how will we do this in all these kind of different play styles, right? So perhaps, um, you know, one way would be to, you know, convince a guard that would be stationed next to the door, to just let you through, right? Um, uh, through like sort of like a social kind of uh, path or you could take the guy out um, uh, take I don't know like a pass that would enable you to go through the door without actually letting go of your gun maybe if you are invested as a melee character it actually doesn't really matter to you you just walk through the door and then punch the guy on the other hand, uh, side into like a pile of blood um, or maybe as a kind of hacker type of character, you try to find a way to breach the network to disable the device, right, the, the scanner that would prevent your weapons from using usage, allowing you to move through and uh, then use your guns on whatever your target is. Um, maybe as a kind of fast solo kind of character, you'd be able to, to go, jump out of the window onto a windowsill, double jump to the, you know, like a balcony and then enter through the window there. And uh, the, the list goes on and on with examples that we try to come up for this kind of door. And it's sort of, again, it's just to showcase how we sort of think about these levels, right? It's, as, you know, putting in a problem that the player has to solve. And we give him a lot of different tools and possibilities to solve this issue or bypass it in their own way. And that is how we're hoping to really create an uh, experience for the player that they feel inherently is their own, right? They came up with a solution given the systems that we gave them and uh, and they really get to feel like the badass cyberpunk V that uh, we want them to feel like. It's actually also a lot of fun to work on this from a story perspective because, you know, as an example on the Wild Hunt, we were already working with very non-linear stories, but now we also have this non-linear gameplay approach. And for us, it was always really important to have these choices and consequences. And we did them in the story, you know, anything should matter somehow. 
But now we can also say, okay, players have all of these different choices to solve a situation. So of course, there should also sometimes be some consequences and not just on the gameplay side, how you solve it, but of course, you know, the story should react to it. Do I just run into this room and kill a few guys or do I, you know, choose a super different approach? Sometimes this can now open up a completely new way to go through a quest. So, you know, it actually, I think it added to this whole layer of non-linearity. It added quite a few, uh, let's say, more things we have to do. But <laughs> the thing is, it is a challenge for us, but it's actually a really fun challenge. It's actually really cool to come up with all these ideas. And the thing is also our quests are iterated upon a lot. So as an example, you know, quest designers, of course, we play them ourselves. Pavel as our lead plays them again. Directors play them. And also, you know, most importantly, QA plays our quests a lot and our QA team has really, really good ideas. So, you know, they always think, okay, what do I think right now? What would I want to do in this situation? And then we often communicate and this is how some of the best ideas are actually created, just through going through these missions over and over again and always finding some new ways to approach them and some new ways to, you know, find interesting consequences, what to happen afterwards. Yeah, and that I, I think sort of uh, ties up with a whole philosophy of a game, which is the freedom. And we have a freedom on the story layer, and maybe I don't want to talk about it too, too much and uh, not to spoil it, but yeah, no it, it <laughs> but it ties up with the gameplay very well, with like the way how the levels are constructed and with branching gameplay, as Philip just explained, because player has freedom playing the game. You build your character the way you want, and you play the way you want, and you want the player to feel this choice, you know, that he's doing depending of you know how skills he's assigning, what weapons he or she is picking, and all that, and it all comes together as like you know fulfilling this ultimate like cyberpunk fantasy. So in the demo we obviously saw the bike, there was a little mention of the heavy armor car, but can you tell us a little bit more about the kinds of vehicles that will be in Cyberpunk 2077? Mm -hmm. I can tell you a little bit about it. So, <laughs> there's of course many different kinds of vehicles because we want to create a real open city, a you know, city that makes sense in the year 2077, so there will be all kinds of vehicles and of course there's also you know society is very different so you know we also have different art styles that correspond with the different parts of society so we have the art style called entropy so as an example you might see vehicles that are just very useful they're made <laughs> to just bring a person from a to b or you know they're made to do a job and of course but you know the player can choose to have them as well especially if you know the player might not have that much uh, money yet but there's also you know super luxury high-end vehicles on the other side of the coin so of course you know you as a player are only limited by what you can afford that's like real life yeah it's, <laughs> life is like that's what we strive for <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you know we, we try to thrive for variety so you know we also looked like what are the kinds of vehicles players would want to have in a cyberpunk game so you know we don't just have cars we of course also have bikes like our very own uh, yaiba kuzanagi here one of my favorites it's a very very cool bike and there's some, let's say, surprise vehicles uh, that are still to be seen in Cyberpunk that I don't want to spoil here, but uh, I would say something uh, very special that's also dear to my heart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm really intrigued. But of course also, let's say, the super highest echelon of people in that city, they also have access to AVs, so flying cars, which is something that you as a player, you're not part of that world, but through specific story moments, you might get to, you know, ride in them sometimes. So, you know, we want to give you a few different experiences. But yeah, you can also, of course, you know, you have your garage where your apartment is. So you can also have your own vehicle that you store and that you can call to yourself. So, you, you know, you can't call your vehicle Roach if you want to. It's all up to you, but it will be your very own. I wonder how many of these cars are going to be called Roach now that you've mentioned it. So Night City is massive and that's like a point we're really trying to make. It's a huge, huge city and you kind of want people to explore it by foot, right? You could just walk like from point A to point B if that's what you want or drive. You could, but probably you would get pretty tired because it's a pretty big place. So you will have to walk a lot. So the thing is, you know, we do not have loading screens while exploring the city. It's a completely seamless place. You can go, you know, wherever you want. And of course, Night City is a very dense place. So there's lots to see on your way. But the thing is also, you know, as with all things, we want to give players a choice. So of course, there's the option to fast travel. But the thing is actually the way we're designing the city, we actually kind of feel like even when we're playing it ourselves, that fast travel is often just 
When I play the game, I don't want to fast travel. I want to explore the city because we actually tried to give you so many interesting things. So many places that tell a story that look interesting, where you have something to do, where you can interact with things that just, just something new for you at every corner. So I personally don't fast travel a lot. I just drive my bike and I put on some nice music and I have a good time. But of course, you know, it's possible. And the thing is also, we actually have proper city planners working here that actually are planning out Night City oh, wow. and you know how the traffic would work in that city and how it would actually make the most sense how a city like that would actually grow organically and you know how it would flow uh, how the traffic would flow through there so it's actually really interesting to also just have that part of game development now as part of you know Cyberpunk 2077 because this will be very important for how people actually get to explore it themselves to make the city feel alive exactly yeah Okay, so in The Witcher, everybody who's played The Witcher knows those question marks on the map, those points of interest. You dreamt about them when you were at work, you just thought about them. You can't walk past them. So what will we be sort of looking at for Cyberpunk? You know, what are those things that are going to be uh, all-consuming us so we are probably not paying attention to the main story? We're going to be like, oh, I've got to go do that first and I can't go and do this until I've done that one over there. What will we be finding? So in Night City, you actually really want to tie it into the world. So as an example, most districts have a so-called fixer, like you might know from our uh, gameplay demo from a year ago, there's Dexter Deshawn. And people like this, they, you know, they can give you jobs that also fit the specific district you're in. So if, when you enter a district and you know, you're kind of known as a mercenary who's doing certain things for money, fixers might contact you and they have some jobs for you. And then these jobs, you know, as an example, they can be street stories. And they show up on your map and you kind of, you, you, know, you get an icon so you know, okay, this is this kind of street story. And we always want to put some interesting story to them. Because after uh, Wild Hunt, we actually founded a completely new team, the Open World Team, which is actually creating some amazing content to actually fill this world with things that are meaningful. So, you know, we actually want to make this that you can do many also smaller things around the city, but they're actually all cool and unique in their own way. And one cool thing is also, of course, they appear on your map, but the map in the game is actually properly immersive. It's that really, really cool looking point cloud version of Night City. And you can see uh, the tasks from your fixer there. But the cool thing is actually because, you know, you're a character in Cyberpunk, you're V, and you actually have this information. So it's not just the player seeing them, it's actually your character seeing them as well because it's all part of the world. So we want to give you this full immersion. Yeah, it's actually really, really cool for us that um with the street stories and all the other content, we're essentially sort of giving him like almost our Witcher 3 side quest treatment in the sense that even simple tasks can be fun and exciting if we pack them up in a cool story and root them within the world, right? So we can use these street stories to, to expand further on how life in Night City and the world of Cyberpunk in general works. And uh, sometimes this might even be a better staging ground than the, the main story itself, right? Mm -hmm. Where just like, hey, let's see how everyday life works in this kind of aspect, from this perspective, in this scenario. And actually, that's, uh, again, like for us, that's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it's a very exciting process. And I hope that um, when players f play it at the end, that they will actually find that it sort of enriches their experience because they always kind of have this impression like, hey, wow, no matter where I go, um, things are actually worked out, right? It's never just a simple sort of task of, hey, do things, like, but there's always a reason, there's always an understanding of why you're doing things. And even in those few scenarios where it might seem a bit more, you know, oblivious, you'll usually find that, you know, uh, there's, there's more to it than meets the eye. Yeah, and one interesting thing about those street stories is also that, you know, our main story is, of course, your own personal journey through Night City, but the street stories are actually, because, you know, you play a mercenary who's trying to carve their way through the city, this is actually your job. So this is actually the role you now inhabit in this city. So actually you're part of that system through these street stories and through working with fixers. So it's actually this whole different way of playing, you know, the game and feeling immersed in the city. Can't wait to lose my life to them. <laughs> <laughs> so in the deep dive, we can see that the character has three sort of origins that we can pick. I mean, what are they and how do they actually affect the gameplay? 
Oh, okay.、Um, You're like,、so、yes, let's go. <laughs> yeah, okay.、Uh, I'll go into my 50 minute answer. Okay, so、uh, we actually call them life paths.、Uh, those are the origin stories that player can pick. And、uh, it's actually three of them. So you can be a street kid, you can be a nomad, or you can be a corporal. Now, each of them actually defines the beginning of the story for the player. So you start in a completely different way than other life paths,、uh, and you are slowly introduced into that story. You know a different people. You're in a completely different place in life, you're in a different place in Night City, and your story slowly, you know, you get involved into that whole thing with Chip and Johnny Silverhand, and eventually, you know, you are Lander. But you actually start off being a completely different person. Now, what is important with that is we actually take that through the whole game. And you, as a player, you can actually associate yourself with like nomads, you can associate yourself with、uh, uh, corporate people, or you can be a part of the streets. And it's It's really up to you, you know, what path you want to pick through the main story. And we did our best in the quest team to like support all those like three, I would say, main ways to go through the story. And of course, p l a y e r can like mix and match anytime, you know, any way、uh, he really wants、uh, or he, she really wants.、Uh, but it's something that we take from the very beginning till the very end. And what's important there is when you're in the scenes with the characters, so when you're discussing things, you can actually use those things. So if you're a corpo and you know how the corporations work, you know what are their normal methods, you know、uh, what's the deal with them, you actually can use this knowledge and sometimes get something more. You can actually unlock side branches in the dialogues and you can unlock side branches in the whole quest sometimes. And this is a, a bit exciting, I would say. It's something like the way how we, how we to make sure that the player can role play their. Character, you know, to become that that person. And、um, in the demo that we have that we have shown in the recording, you can you can see, you know, this this moment when you choose, you know, that character that you're you are becoming、uh, later.、Um, and the characters that you are meeting in the main story, they are also representing those different groups, you know. So、um, in the first demo a year ago, we have shown Meredith Stout, you know, a person, you know, she is a high class corporate woman from the military. She has a lot of power, also a lot of responsibility, and you are. Are on her way, and you can see you know, how that interaction looks like. So, if you're when you're from corporation, maybe there's something you can do a bit more with her, you know. And that goes also for others, you know, for nomads and for、uh, for street kids. One of the nice things is actually also that you know, you're not bound to stick, let's say, with the corporates or with the streets. So, as an example. I can give an example. I start as a street kid the game, and I always I know I have my knowledge, but then I play through the story and I notice, like, oh, I kind of like these corporate characters. I, I, I like that life. So, you know, I can just, you know, betray the streets and snuggle up with the corporates. But, you know, this is kind of the role playing freedom we want to give. But, you know, as always, this can also have consequences for you. So, anyone who's played the original tabletop version of Cyberpunk is used to the idea of assigning attribute points to create a character. Now, in the deep dive video we just saw, we got a little glimpse of that screen. You could see the points and the different things. So, help me understand how that works and how you gain those points. So, as a player, you build your character at the beginning, assigning those attribute points. And they define like, the core characteristics of your character. So,、uh, how much body strength you have, or how much reflexes you have, or how cool you are. You know, that's、uh, one of the interesting stats that we have, right?、Uh, but then, as you have those attributes, you also have a skills. The skills define a bit more. Interesting proficiencies for you as a player, what you can do. And for instance, one of those skills is assassination or the cold blood. And maybe I'll stick to the cold blood to explain a bit more. So, this is a skill that allows the player. To survive in a really tough situation. So, at the moment, you know, you get a lot of damage, then the、uh, cold blood skill kicks in, thanks to your cool stat. It kicks in and gives you a boost in damage, and then as a player, you can, you know, survive and so on. But then, you know, using that skill, so you sort of like use by learning, like using that skill, you can actually get better, pump up levels there, and you can get different perks. Now, what's interesting there, you can actually give completely different perks to the skill that you have. And here, I, I think I could use the example of the athletics attribute. So, the athletics is the way for us to move dead bodies. So, as a player, you can basically pick up the dead body that you have just、uh, made, well, basically killed, <laughs> pick it up and like stuff it into the fridge or in a trash bin. Now, as a player, you normally will slow down、uh, when you're moving、uh, around with the bodies. But if you have 
added special perks to your at athletic skill, you can now run with the dead body. So because you are more athletic, you can do that. And those are like three levels of complexity in our um, character, in building the character we have. You have the attributes, you have the skills, and then you assign perks to it. And those three come together to allow you to create your own amazing character that you want to play it. A lot of people think this is maybe how cool you look and it's all about the jacket you're wearing, but the cool stat is not uh, style-based, is it? Well, you know, this is cyberpunk, so being cool is, of course, very important. <laughs> but the actual cool stat really means how cool you are under pressure, how much you have control over your body. So, you know, are there people shooting at me and I'm holding my gun like that? Probably not very cool. So this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that cool actually controls. But of course, you know, if you want to play a character that's actually cool, you have your choices, right? You can, you can wear your nice leather jacket. <laughs> and of course, you know, like in real life, also depends on how you talk to people. And that's, of course, also the choice of you as a player. You just might freak out under gunfire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, cool on the surface, but not so much when push comes to shove. <laughs> Happens sometimes. <laughs> So in the deep dive, we saw a quick clip of the inventory screen. It looks like a proper old school RPG screen, you know, with the little blocks of the system. And I know the community wants to hear more about what they can expect. So tell us more, Miles. Oh, I will. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, of course, like, how I always say is, um, you know, uh, in, in Cyberpunk, the inventory screen is, of course, where we manage our items, right? But most importantly, in Cyberpunk, it's where we also manage our style. And just as Philip just touched on, um, you know, like it's really important for us to be able, for you to be able to realize your character. And that, of course, comes in the character creation, but also the way you dress your character, right? Um, we're pretty much aware that there is sort of this, in most RPGs, there's this common sort of disconnect between the stats on an item and the looks. While we can go into details here, uh, let's just say we're aware of this sort of, you know, uh, conflict, I guess, of interest sometimes. Um, so we're looking into uh, how you would be able to make your character still look cool despite having the best stats of an item, right? Um, just goes to show that that is really important to us. And of course, you know, um, the whole role-playing aspect goes even further because we'll, we'll have some customization options not only for the way you look like but also your guns right and the inventory you will of course decide what kind of weaponry it is that your character uses to kill people with or um, or sneak into to uh, different uh, you know bases locations because of course there's also where we mention cyberware um, and all of these little things brought together again they've, they've sort of allow you to fulfill your, your sort of uh, what do you call it Character fantasy, that's the word I was looking for. In the inventory, yes, we're changing our clothes, we want to look super cool, but what about cyberware? Can we do anything with cyberware from the inventory screen? Oh, yes. So imagine imagine inventory screen, right? So if you see the player there, you have a slot, so normally in like, let's say, fantasy game, you would equip a armor, right? Or you would equip, I, I don't know, a leg piece or something. Like, right now here, you can actually replace that with a cyberware, right? So you can get your legs replaced to your cyber legs, right? And those can you can give you different skills, like let's say double jump. But then, as a player, you can upgrade actually those and, let's say, enhance them in a way that they give you something special to it. So, for instance, you can actually make them jump in a way that they do not emit that much sound and they become like a like a really stealth tool so because of that you can traverse in a quiet way through the locations so this is how you actually upgrade your character you just go over your body and replace whatever you need and um, in the Lord there are Reaper dogs who help you out with that when you have to install those core pieces of cyberware like for instance the Raven control system that allows you to control the flathead but there are also other pieces that you can do on your own and on top of that as a player you can also find pieces small pieces called shards and those if you slot into your slot you can actually they give you a power of a given cyberware so you can try it out so as a player you can experiment a bit you know and see how it would be if i would have installed you know some special piece of cyberware in my body and that allows the player to you know to see stuff to figure it out to build their character the way they want okay so we know we can equip some of our cybernetic enhancements in the inventory but like where do we get them? Like, how do we get more enhancements? All right, there's actually um, 
multiple ways of going about that, right? The most obvious one is going to a so-called ripper dock and getting new cyberware built in you or enhancing the cyberware that you have. Um, some of it you will actually get through your, as you adventure through uh, Night City. Um, things like the Kuroshi Eye implant that we have, right? It's, it's almost mandated on top of you because it's sort of like a core gameplay mechanic to be able to scan things and get additional information uh, on certain circumstances. And um, of course then we also have something we call the street cred system, right? So as you progress throughout the game you will also unlock more street cred through your actions and that will enable you to unlock more content in the game, that means you know more vendors will open up to you, more services will open up. People will have heard of you and are more willing to work with you. Um, so there's actually multiple ways this this affects your experience, and uh, yeah, one of them being you know like the cyberware that you have access to. Cool. So Netrunner was featured pretty heavily in the deep dive, but can you give us a little bit more insight into some of the combat skills or abilities that come with the idea of building a Netrunner? Class. Yeah, so I think using net running skills gives you lots of, let's say, opportunities to be very creative in how you play the game. So I can just give a few examples. So we have access points, and access points are, you know, in the world of cyberpunk, they can control all the different devices in the area, which of course as a net runner is pretty useful, because you can hack that access point, and if you successfully do that, you can now use quick hacks. So you can actually, from a distance, take over different devices, like as an example, a camera. You can do many different things with it. Look through the camera and have a completely different view or just, you know, turn it off if it's in your way. And of course, you know, you can take over a turret and make it fight for you or you can do many different things, you know. We also try to come up with nice custom things. So, you know, depending on where you are, let's say if you're in a gym where there's some nice boxing robot, of course, you know, <laughs> maybe you can do some fun things with that. So I think as a Netrunner, it's always lots of fun to use different things. and. As an example, if I would use lots of net running skills, uh, skills, it's also really useful to use lots of cool skills that make me really good at stealth, so I'm you know, really under control. So a net runner can be really good at you know, also using distractions, like if there's a vending machine, just make it spit out some drinks, and then of course you know, might, some people might look after that. But the thing is, a net runner isn't you know, just a stealth character. There's also cool, aggressive net running abilities, because you know, we always want to give you the choice of how to play. So we have your nanowire cyberware, which is really good at hacking enemies from a distance and then actually taking over their cyberware. So you know, most people in this world have cyberware in their body, so just like access points, very good times for net runners. So you can then control that cyberware and also do some nice things like, you know, as an example, hack someone's cyberware in their hand and make them do some things they might not want to have happen to them. <laughs> but the thing is also the nano wire, of course, it's a wire, it's nano, it's very, you know, sharp. So you can also use it as a weapon or as a whip. And, you know, the net runner can be very effective at using his skills in combat as well. So it's all just, you know, your choice as a player. What about, let's say, because this all sounds amazing, but let's say you want to do slightly non-lethal. Because in the deep dive we did saw with Sasquatch at the end, there was an option. You know, yep. do you want to put her out of misery or do you want to let her live? So how do people play it like a non-lethal playthrough? Can you know, can you build a class to help you do that? Mm -hmm. So that's basically a choice we made. We really said, okay, cyberpunk, it is a very violent world. Mm -hmm but you're role-playing your character. You can choose to play the whole game without killing a single person. And of course, you know, we're always saying this should also have an effect on the story. So certain characters, you know, in a quest might ask you, you know, yeah, please do this thing for me, but you know, don't, don't make too much trouble. And of course, you know, you don't get a game over if you do a thing that the character doesn't wanna. So, but the story will react to it. And we want to give you that choice. But of course, you know, not only the Netrunner is able to do a non-lethal playthrough, Every player, however you want to skill your character, you're able to do it somehow. But of course it also depends, you know, where you are. Let's say if you're in some rundown ruin that doesn't have lots of net running abilities, of course a net runner still has ways to do it, but you know, he might not be able to use all of his net running skills. But another player who has skilled different ways now has a different experience. But you know, it can happen vice versa. But what we always want to say, you can finish the whole game, you can finish the quests without killing a single person. Sometimes you just have to also, you know, think about it. Because the thing is, Night City isn't a very peaceful place. So you can never play like a full pacifist who is never engaging in any kind of combat. Because, you know, people will attack you sometimes, but you can choose to, you know, 
not kill them because you know like in real life sometimes if there's attacks you don't immediately kill everyone you can solve situations in different ways uh, yeah all right one thing I'd actually like to add to that is that um, we're trying really hard uh, to not actually punish players for the playstyle they chose to do right whether it is that you're playing a lethal or non-lethal or uh, you know, like a more aggressive versus a more subtle kind of approach. Um, while NPCs might sort of have certain wishes for you how to approach a situation, um, they will never outright punish you for not, you know, sort of doing their wishes. Uh, because we really want to give players as much freedom as possible and, you know, taking, uh, the, punishing the players for certain actions like that, which is basically them choosing to play their character, would directly contradict this kind of idea that we're trying to set up in terms of uh, role-playing fantasy. There's never, nothing worse than, like, accidentally slipping on the trigger and you're like, I didn't mean to kill them, and then yeah, everything exactly. changed, yeah. yeah. And as an example, you can also see a Sasquatch that we show in our demo. It's a really intense fight, but actually, if you choose, you can subvert that fight. You can maybe just, you know, sneak around her and find a different solution. And then maybe, you know, of course, you can get a consequence out of that because now Sasquatch is still alive. So, you know, the story is already different. So I think this opens up many different opportunities, just not just for the gameplay, but also for us as storytellers. But let's tell us a little bit more about the solo build, because that was another build from in the deep dive. What kind of skills does that give someone then, as opposed to Netrunner? I think that the most typical like solo fantasies that, that our players have is to be a strong solo and to be fast solo. So it's so like two different... A, like, I would say so. Uh, but you can also build any type of hi hybrid you want. But the strong one is the person who can, you know, like shove people into the trash bins and so on, carry bodies, run with them. But you can also like pick up the, the heavy guns, you know, mount it to the, to the turret and like use it against, you know, the opponents. Like we have, we have shown that in, in the recording for a moment, you know, when when V is like just you know like killing everything on her way with this very heavy gun you of course cannot like take it to your inventory and run around with everything uh, with it everywhere but this is the only like I would say build that allows you to do that right so uh, this is very very special however if uh, like as a fast solo you have access to lots of different traversing skills so as an exp as a means of exploration you can for instance do the double jump and access places that you would not have otherwise right you can also you know like slide around with your katana or like slide around using nanowire that we have also shown so uh, you can be built in a completely in a completely different ways built based on the stats that you have picked as a as a person sounds really really cool i'm just gonna run in i think and just punch everything until i get what i want which is also like real life. <laughs> yeah, exactly This game the same. is so close to real life. It's <laughs> quite incredible, actually. <laughs> it literally happens every day. So we know we've talked about Netrunner and Solo, and we've shown both of them in our deep dive, but that's not just it, right? Like, there are other builds. So, you know, maybe tell us about Techie. Yeah, um, so generally how we approach this kind of stuff is we've sort of thought... Um, we're thinking of three sort of main archetypes of how you can play the game. That would be the Netrunner playstyle, right? The solo playstyle, which has probably set sort of branches into sort of more agile, fast solo, and the more brutish, uh, strong solo character. And then there's the last one, which is the techie. Again, it's just important for us to say that these are just archetypes uh, that, that you know, help us think about how players might approach any kind of situation. But of course, you'll be able to create any kind of hybrid and just pick the skills that you like in between. And the techie, you know, is sort of a more technically uh, uh, affiliated playstyle, right? Um, whereas the netrunner uh, is the one that sort of manipulates devices that are active by, by hacking networks and taking over control. The techie is actually the one that sort of dabbles with the hardware itself and uh, cables and, and whatever drives machinery, all that stuff. And to add on top of that, we're actually layering uh, our little buddy called Flathat, and he is what we call a spider bot, a kind of very sophisticated piece of military hardware um, that the player will be able to use uh, when he chooses to, to you know, uh, invest into the techie playstyle. And 
Flathead is an interesting one because uh, he's a pretty, like, basically like this autonomous robot that listens to your commands. And you can basically send out Flathead to do certain things for you, right? You might be able to send him out to manipulate certain devices, right? There might be, I don't know, let's come up with an example here. Um, there is uh, some sort of uh, like broken broken lamp or something or like a broken gadget you can see it with your scanner right and you might actually send flathead to do a little bit of tweakage there to make that object fall down onto an enemy right uh, or, or other examples would be to, to use flathead to you know directly engage with enemies there's a certain customization options that that might be tied to to a buddy robot, and uh, I, I hope actually players will be, will get like oddly attached to their little robot buddy, right? And uh, and it, again, this is like a whole sort of layer, an, another layer of how you might play the game. And as I said earlier, with us thinking of the archetypes, it is like one of the possible many many possible ways of how to play the game and we're trying to add as many tools as we can for all three of these archetypes to really sort of be able to manipulate the game world and and feel like yeah this this world you know if i look around i see opportunities that suit me you know you're maybe fantasizing to play as a sort of terminator kind of character right we have our scanner you look around see opportunities and you seize them and that and how you seize them and what opportunities uh, arise for it really just depends on what kind of uh, character you're playing and what skills you have invested in okay so we all stand flathead we know that flathead is everything but also let's talk about actual weapons let's talk about guns what can we expect? Because we saw a few. We saw the Militech turret being ripped out, used as a machine gun. We saw the nano wires, but tell us a little bit more. Um, so our guns are divided into three like main categories, right? There is a, there are smart guns that we have shown in a previous demo like a year ago. So basically they shoot like homing bullets that are following target. Uh, there are also tech weapons and the tech weapons are those that have like additional uh, capabilities to them that they, they for instance can pierce covers. And uh, there are also power weapons and power weapons are mainly focused on being a street grid, uh, grid weapon so they basically basically have additional skills and, and capabilities connected to the fact they're reworked in some way. So for instance, those are like bursting shotguns and things like that. And we have put plenty of work to making sure that the weapons feel well and they, they, they have their weight. Um, and there's lots of really cool examples that I can give here. Uh, for instance, you know, there is a uh, handgun that as you use it, it actually speeds up the bullets slowly. and and longer you use it, faster the bullets become, so they can do more, more things and they can do more damage. Uh, there is, for instance, like a class of the weapons for the handguns uh, that, is, that has been created by a Russian company to uh, fight cyborgs. And that weapon like, is able to heat up the bullet to the point that the bullet becomes almost, almost like a melted plastic. And it's done, for instance, so it can shoot off you know, cyborgs' arms and so on. So, all, there's always like a small piece of story, you know, wrapped up around the weapon, you know, what, what that weapon does. And uh, what's interesting here, I think, is that you can also use like a second uh, firing mode for a weapon. And not all weapons have them, but some of them, if you use them in a specific way, let's say a tech rifle that we have shown in a previous demo, when you like, um, when you use it in a specific way, it changes its, its way, it like collapses together, and then it allows you to pierce up the covers and shoot through the walls and uh, shoot the enemies like that. Or you can, you know, bounce bullets off the walls, right? Using the ricochet. Um, so it, all the, we, we try to always put enough depth into the gun. For instance, I like literally today, I have seen like awesome shotgun that has eight barrels and they shoots them in the same time and it, it has like a actually our, our I think that players will love our gunplay especially the way how the guns look and the, how they feel when you shoot them I'm so excited that, that that's yeah shotguns they're my favorite eight barrels even better
I think also something really cool to add to this is that, um, you know, as you already touched on it, like all of these companies, these gun manufacturers and all that stuff, they actually, I mean, a lot of it comes from the actual lore, right? But we're also making sure that, you know, there's a history to everything that includes the, the brands and ads that we have in the game. We actually have like a whole team dedicated to just that kind of stuff. And again, it sort of is in line with our philosophy to make sure that everything is rooted in the world, has its reason why it is there, has its history. History, I think that's really sort of like the secret ingredient to make like a really believable world that when the player actually goes in that they have this impression like yeah this place exists right this feels alive and uh, I think that will make uh, just the fact of simply walking through Night City like a really really cool uh, experience. Also actually one of the cool things we also have is we have lots of different melee weapons and you know, it starts by you know a very spontaneous one. So let's say you find a broken bottle and you just use it, or you find a knife on the ground and you can use it to fight melee, or you can, as an example, throw it. But you can also specialize in melee weapons, because as we said earlier, maybe you want to play as a cyber ninja. And of course, as a cyber ninja, there's many different katanas that you can actually also specialize in getting really good at them. And there's even cyberware for melee, like the gorilla fists that it can also be used to, you know, be really strong and open doors. But, you know, if you're really strong, you can also hit people with it. But a cool thing is also using your melee weapons together with special cyberware. So as an example, my favorite cyberware that I always like to use is the Sandevistan. And essentially it slows down time for you because your reflexes get boosted. So now you have superhuman reflexes and the way we show it is of course time slowing down for you as a player. So imagine you have your katana and you just go into a slide and then you can aim and like just go through and it, it, it actually feels really cool like you feel like you have super control but actually you can also see as an example in the demo how it feels like to be in the receiving end of cyberware like that because the animals have reflex boosting cyberware as well so actually sometimes when they're coming towards you in melee they sip around really fast so that's what that is exactly ah. and this is how it actually feels for enemies when, when you have your you know slow-mo this is how they see you moving around so it can be pretty scary to also find someone who uses the same cyberware you use what about you two then what about what are your favorite cyberwares that you've seen so far that you can talk about so far <laughs> before you get me in trouble oh i think that that uh, at least for me I, I think those those are gonna be mantis blades uh i think that's the that's the best one uh we have shown how it looks for the player how it feels uh when you use them uh you know the way you can chop off heads and so on it's uh something of a po <laughs> it's very poetic i would say um yeah, and in in other cyberware, I think that I would like it's more story related. It's uh, Mr. Stud. I will let our players to figure it out <laughs> <laughs> what it does <laughs> for those who know the lore a bit. Uh, for me, Philip already took it away by by taking the strong arms earlier and the sand of his done. So a bit of a greedy dude over there. <laughs> uh, no, but. So I guess technically the cyber deck is a cyber piece of cyberware, right? That's the one that actually allows you to to uh, breach into networks, take over control, and you know use all that that hacking magic on on all kinds of enemies, right? Like in the in the gameplay, we show how you can not only manipulate this training robot, but you can also manipulate devices that you might not think are necessarily hackable, like the the bench press uh, that that we showed there, and. Um, it goes even further than that, right? If you combine that with, uh, like, for example, the nanowires, but also you can do it from a, from closer up, uh, you can actually breach into, like, a squad's internal network by hacking directly into the personal links of uh, of enemies. And once you're in the squad network, you can actually use what we call demon software, and to essentially quick hack the cyberware that is attached to people's bodies, right? So uh, imagine a scenario where you know. You're a netrunner kind of character, you're sneaking through, but th then things get hot, right? So now you find yourself in a combat situation. Luckily, of course, you come prepared. You already foresaw that things might might go wrong because you're a skilled netrunner after all. So you already breached into the squad's internal network. Now, these enemies start swarming you, and what do you do? Of course, you start using your scanner, then you look at these guys and you realize, hey, I breached the security, so I can now upload my virus software into these guys to make them do things that 
um, they don't necessarily want. You might hack their cybernetic hand um, to, to force them to pull the pin on a grenade they have at their you know, grenade belt, um, setting them to a fiery and explosive but spectacularly looking death. Um, <laughs> Now, thirdly, we also have one that uh, you can actually use to basically make enemies finish themselves off, right? They'll shut themselves down. And uh, it's actually really cool because you sort of see them struggling with their hand as well. So it's like you, it really sells the fantasy of what you're doing, right? And you're basically becoming this cybernetic god as soon as you take over a network. And uh, it, it really is something that, you know, feels so different from the other play styles uh, that we have. And, and I really like the sort of level of variety that we offer players uh, in, when, when it comes to that. And I think that ultimately uh, and pardon me for being a bit buzzworthy about this, but like this will really make each playthrough very unique to players, right? Not only the way you play it, the way you interact with the world, the way you talk to people, all that kind of stuff. Like if you look at all the little choices that accumulate through the game, no playthrough will basically be like another. And uh, and inherently, they will also feel very differently depending on what kind of uh, uh, you know character you you want to play. And I guess that would be the more less obvious one because as a netrunner you'll always be sort of having your cyber deck because otherwise you could not be a netrunner. Um, and then I, I think I've mentioned before in a, another video of sorts that I really really like our nanowires yeah. which go hand in hand sort of with this netrunning playstyle. I guess you can see where my preferences, personal preferences lie. Um, don't worry, it does not affect my designs. <laughs> I try to be balanced. Um, but. Uh, you know, like whereas the regular netrunner can sort of reach into a, a squad network by sort of taking an enemy out and having an extra option to breach into into their squad's network, the nanowires actually allow you to do this from a distance or from a safe spot, right? And they can also be used to slice people into bite-sized pieces. So again, as Philip said much earlier, if I remember correctly, um, We've been doing this for a bit. <laughs> um, there's actually, you know, no playstyle that is sort of meant to be played in a certain way, right? We don't go, okay, the hacker kind of character, he's the stealthy guy, he needs to operate from the shadows, whereas the, the solo type, he's the one that, you know, just goes out and shoots everyone. No, you can actually still, within these playstyles, choose how you play uh, the, the kind of character, lethal, non-lethal, stealthy and non-stealthy, and uh, we just give you the tools in all playstyles to do whatever you want with it, right? So if you want to be a combat netrunner, if you will, that likes to use gunfire and, uh, you know, making people blow themselves up, sure, go do that, but you can also do it in a stealthy approach. It really lies uh, in the player's hands. So let's say I've got my eight barrel shotgun. It's my, it's my favorite gun. I love it. What can I do to it? Can I customize it? Is it moddable? Are there any options for, you know, really making something special and one of a kind? So I think we can say that there are like two major ways what you can do, how you can customize your guns. One way is customizing the visuals and those are different skins and like paint overs, paint jobs that you can have on your gun just to make sure that, you know, when you're a Cupid uh, that your rifle is pink or, or purple, you know, if you really want it. But then there's the second way how you can customize it. It's a different sort of attachments that you can have. You can have silencers, you know, uh, you can have like a sniper rifle zoom on the gun. You also can boost up the stats of the given weapon. So in that way, you can basically make it more efficient. So you can make it uh, to look the way you want and you can make it to shoot you way you want. I think, Mars, you've mentioned this before, that also changes the animation, right? As it progresses, you can change the way it looks as you reload and things like that. Yeah, so basically the, the more you use your guns, who figures, the better you become <laughs> at shooting them, right? You might start as a complete amateur, like I would be with shooting a gun. <laughs> good to um, know. But yeah, uh, I'm not a very good shot. And the, 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 the better you become with it, you know, that actually affects your way of handling a gun. So, you know, you're like your crosshair might become smaller, indicating that your your accuracy increases ever so slightly, and uh, that will also sort of influence the the way your your animation looks. Like your reload speed will be faster, and all that stuff. So you actually really get this this sense of progression and your character evolving as you play the game. And uh, 
yeah, I think that's pretty special sort of experience if you combine it with the way you know that you can customize your guns man and kind of really have this feeling that yeah this is my signature gun right and i'm really good with it right guys thank you so much i know there is one thing we haven't talked about from the demo and that's a little bit more about the gangs we spoke about the voodoo boys a bit but we haven't even really spoken about the animals and while i know you guys know everything about cyberpunk i thought i'd actually throw out to maybe the godfather himself so I caught up with Mike Pondsmith at Gamescom to ask him, who are the Voodoo Boys and who are the animals? Hi, my name is Mike Pondsmith and I'm the guy who killed your cyberpunk characters. And today I'm going to talk to you about two very important things. I'm going to talk to you about animals and I'm going to talk to you about the Voodoo Boys. So let's take the Voodoo Boys. When I created them many, many years ago, I was looking at kind of a really interesting idea, which is what we would now call cultural appropriation. What happens when somebody comes in and tries to adopt a culture that they know little or nothing about and does it really badly. But one of the great things about having a few years is that you get a chance to do some redos. And one of the best ones is what we have with the Voodoo Boys now. The Voodoo Boys in 2077, are really Voodoo Boys. They inherited the name, but it was sort of a natural fit. They were coming from Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and they were the real thing. And they managed to take a lot of the elements of their original culture and meld it into the world of 2077 to bring that cyberpunk vibe into a very old and respected culture. So they're a gang, but they're not really. They're more of a cultural phenomenon. They're more a way of cultural exploration. And I think it's really cool because it shows us a side of the cyberpunk future that we normally wouldn't see. On the other hand, they're the animals. Um, way, way back in my dark, dank past, I used to lift. Don't anymore, but I used to. And I would see guys like the animals in the gym I went to. Guys who live to get strong, and get really strong, and get really strong. The animals are like those guys. They're in it to basically build themselves up and become the tigers of their particular urban jungle. They want to be big, they want to be bad, and they want you to fear them just because they exist. And you know, it's really easy to fear a guy who blots out the sun when he walks by you. But the animals are very simple. They have an ethos, get big, lift, get strong, lift. So unlike the voodoo boys who have a culture, the animals have a thing. And contrasting that is interesting because in 2077, you get a chance to see that not every gang is the same as every other gang. And what motivates them depends on the people you meet on the street. Check it out. This is Mike Pondsmith saying, I'm still here to kill your cyberpunk character. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into Cyberpunk 2077. Now don't forget, you can join us on Twitter, Facebook, forums, and even join us on Discord to make sure you stay up to date on all of our news. Cyberpunk 2077 is launching April 16th, 2020, and is available for pre-order now. On behalf of everybody working on Cyberpunk and here at CD Projekt Red, we thank you for watching, your ongoing support, and we can't wait for you to explore Night City.